test. Good morning. It's about time to begin our class this morning. If uh, you'll be finding a seat. So let's begin our class this morning. Uh, just a moment here. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Bow with me if you would. Holy Father, we are grateful to you this morning for this opportunity to be here, to look into your word. And we pray that you will be with us and that you will guide our thoughts as we look uh, at these things that you have said through the prophet Hosea. And as we glean from those things said to your people so many years ago that we'll see the principles there and we'll see the ways to apply these things to our lives and to ask the important questions about what is our relationship with you. What would you have us to do and to know? And Father, these things are valuable to us as we seek to be pleasing to you as your children. Bless our study this morning and give us the, uh, the means to put these things in our hearts and to carry them with us in our daily walk. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you were expecting Mark Ship this morning, you'll have to decide whether it's a disappointment or whether it's a something better than that. No, he is out uh, preaching at another congregation today and asked me to fill in for him. 
And I'm always tickled to do that for Mark. He's, he, uh, number one, usually is teaching out of the Old Testament, which is very dear to me. And I have scant opportunity for that. So today um, I have the opportunity to look at a couple of chapters, chapters 7 and 8 out of Hosea. And you'll notice that as we go through Hosea, not only does he use a lot of metaphors, but he creates some beautiful word pictures. And some of the things that are said right here in the book of Hosea are just beautiful things. Um, they're hard things in most cases, but they are, they are, uh, they're very well said. They're very beautiful. So uh, let's jump right in this morning. And we will be starting in chapter 7 and verses uh, 1 through 7. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered. And Ephraim is the largest group in Israel. So Ephraim stands in for Israel whenever you see that, that tribe. It's, it's referencing all of, of Israel. The iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits raid outside, and they do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them, they're before my face. With their wickedness they make the king glad, and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker, who ceases to stir up the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the princes became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with scoffers, or their hearts are like an oven as they approach their plotting. Their anger smolders all night. In the morning it burns like a flaming fire. All of them are hot like an oven, and they consume their rulers. All their kings have fallen. None of them calls on me. Now you'll notice that I have, in every section we look at, there will be some part of that where I've underlined a phrase. Um, we are going to come back to these phrases um, at the very end of our study in these two chapters and consider them in an application um, that we can draw today. So take note of those. And all, all of these different paragraphs that we look at can be looked at with a basic framework. First of all, there is assessment. What is their current situation? What are they doing? What is the truth of this? Um, number two, you'll see charges um, that God makes against them in their current situation. And then number three, we'll see consequences that arise. Now, not every section has all three of these, but these are the three constructs that we can see in each one of these sections of the text as we look through them. The assessment, charges, and consequences. Those are the three primary things we should be aware of. In this initial statement in chapter uh, 7 and verse 1, God lets us know that his desire is to heal Israel. He's looking to bless them. They're his children. They're his wife uh, or his bride, and eventually the church will become the bride of Christ, but Israel is God's bride at this point, and he wants to heal them. But when he attempts to do this, his light shines upon them and their evil deeds are uncovered. They deal falsely. Um, the thief enters in. Bandits raid outside. And he has this lament to say about them that they don't consider in their hearts that he remembers all of their wickedness. They somehow have got the idea that with the passage of time, these evil things they have done, since they forget about them, well, surely God forgets about them too. And there's a human idea that says, if you remember things from a long time ago, that this is a problem with you, that you're holding a grudge. And sometimes that's the case, especially where someone has repented of something and you continue to hold that in your heart. 
But not the case with God. God has to, to bring justice into his relationship with people and with nations. Because if he's not just, then this becomes an issue for all of humanity and his relationship with them. So he has mercy. Mercy is his desire. But he also must deal with the sin, with the transgression. And he sees this over time. He can see all of these things as though they're in the present. He remembers them. And his lament is that they are not moved by their own memory of their wickedness and the fact that God remembers their wickedness. So when he would heal them, their deeds surround them. They're before his face. They're just about all he can see. There's so much wickedness in Israel. They're looking to make the king glad and the princes, um, but they in the end are seeking to destroy those who rule among them, the judges, uh, the royal household. So sin is exposed in, in God's desire to help them. So these analogies that he uses here are really plays on words. There are three ways that he uses the word heat. Uh, and in each one of those, you can think of, from a figurative standpoint, the passion that arises out of those. Passion for evil, or it may be a smoldering anger. In all of those ways, it's the burning of these things within them. So let's look at our next passage. Verses uh, 8 through 11. Ephraim mixes himself with the nations. Ephraim has become a cake, not turned. So using again this metaphor of an oven and a, and a baker, this is a cake that has been gone in, but it's never turned. It never is able to complete the normal cooking cycle, and so it's going to turn out to be a mess. It'll be half-baked, only halfway to where it should be, and then ruined because it's not been turned. So they are a, uh, a cake half-turned. Strangers devour his strength, yet he does not know it. Gray hairs also are sprinkled on him, yet he does not know it. Though the pride of Israel testifies against him, yet they have neither turned to the Lord their God, nor have they sought him for all this. So Ephraim has become like a silly dove, without sense. They call to Egypt, then, or they go to Assyria. So we've got this return to the baking. Ephraim has a foot in both worlds. They tell God that they know God. They're going through some of the acts of honoring him, but they really don't know God. And they certainly don't live for God or in a relationship with him, having rejected him and his law and his teachings and his fatherly compassion. Though their pride testifies against them, they haven't returned to God. They don't seek for him in the midst of all of this. So this half-baked pastry, a cake that's not turned, is the result of this. And Hosea goes back and he, he mixes his metaphors quite a bit in his writing, but it's such colorful language and the metaphors bring out the strength of what he is saying to us. So besides only being half done and therefore half raw, useless, ruined, or destroyed, Ephraim is in decline without realizing it. Like senseless doves. So the significant point of this section is that Ephraim has gone to Egypt and to Assyria for help and likely to other nations as well, rather than to the Lord God. And he says this is senseless, this is arrogant. Third section, beginning in verse 12. When they go, I will spread my net over them. 
I will bring them down like the birds of the sky. I will chastise them in accordance with the proclamation or the report to their assembly. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction is theirs, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. Then they do not cry to me from their heart when they wail on their beds. They're crying, they're wailing to be sure, but it's not to God for help, to the God whom they miss. For the sake of grain and new wine, they assemble themselves. They're going through the motions, but it's not to honor God. It has very little to do with God. It's for the new grain, it's for the party, it's for the wine that they have together. They are actually turning away from God as they go through the motions of calling on God. And God says, although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They turn, but not upward. They're not turning to God, in other words. They're like a deceitful bow. Their princes will fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This will be or this will become their derision in the land of Egypt. Israel's appeal to the world around them, to the other nations, is self-defeating. There's a God who has created the world, who is over all the nations, and yet they don't turn to him. They turn to the other nations. And so this is self-defeating for them because the nations consume them rather than really help them. They are watering themselves down. They're giving themselves to, to other things rather than looking to God for their strength. This will be a question for us to consider as we look through applications um, at the end of our class this morning. And that is, where do we turn for power? Where did Israel turn for power? And I think this has implications for the church today. All such attempts by Israel will result in failure. It will result in their discipline and in their destruction. But God's desire is for redemption, even though they have been false. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Put the trumpet to your lips. A vulture comes against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. They cry out to me, my God, we of Israel know you. Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue them. This trumpet, or this shofar as it likely was, was used to call troops into battle, among other things. Vultures, in this metaphor, uh, you might have a translation as an eagle, but this is a vulture, a vulture eagle, um, is coming against the house of the Lord. And vultures come when there's death, when there's decay, and when things are about to die, the vultures gather waiting for their opportune moment. So, around the house of the Lord is decay. There's death. And so the vultures come. It's interesting that this vulture is on the house of the Lord where Israel is insisting that they know the Lord. They don't know the Lord, at least not any longer, and they have rejected him. And so battle and exile are certain in their future because they have transgressed the covenant and do not know the Lord. They've broken their covenant with God. And because they have rejected his covenant and the blessings that are within them and the strength that derives from those, an enemy is going to pursue them and they will pay the price 
for their rebellion. Verses 4 through 6. Israel's idolatry. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, but I did not know it. In other words, they've excluded God from these choices and from their process. With their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves that they might be cut off. He has rejected your calf, O Samaria, saying, My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? You see how powerful some of these words are in Hosea? From Israel is even this, this level of betrayal. A craftsman made it, so it is not God. Surely the calf of Samaria will be broken to pieces. So the royal household uh, in Israel, God was not a part of setting that up. They did this on their own. Also, they have turned to idols instead of to God, to little images which they have made instead of the God of heaven who lives and who speaks and who acts. We're told in First and Second Kings that King Jeroboam I was appointed by God to rule the northern kingdom of Israel after the division of the kingdom between the northern and the southern tribes. Jehu's dynasty was also initiated by God through Elijah the prophet. The kings which followed after these, however, roughly from 740 down to 721 B.C., were all usurpers. They were not appointed by God. They seized the throne, and many of them were assassinated. So one of the things that we can gain from that history is that this passage was likely written after the dynasty of Jehu, after his rule. After the reigns of Jeroboam II and his son Zechariah's reign, which was brief, and perhaps it was written during the time of uh, the King Pekah, uh, roughly 735 or, or so, or, or perhaps even a successor of his. But this passage is reminiscent of other famous passages in Jeremiah and in Isaiah, where workmen take the raw materials of precious materials and they turn them into objects of worship. They make images out of them. But in reality, these are just works of art. There's no life in them, certainly no power in them. They're blocks of wood, they're scraps of metal, but they are not gods. This is also a brief and a provocative glimpse into the worship in the royal houses in Israel under these kings. Calves of Samaria is the same. They adopt those, or this calf, um, and there's, of course, a famous golden calf in Israel's history as part of the Exodus, having come out of Egypt. Um, there are calves in Dan and Bethel in the archaeological record, um, but there also were Canaanite idols in the North Israelite capital. So we may not specifically have found a calf, um, but it's, it does fit very well within that context of what we know. Let's look at 7 through 10. And again, pay attention to these underlined passages. We're going to come back to them. For they sow the wind, and they reap the whirlwind. This is a lot stronger than our modern saying. We don't tend to use this one as much. There's a more modern saying, you reap what you sow. Um, it's in the New Testament. Perhaps that's why we're more, um, we're more familiar with that one as an idiom. The standing grain, he says, has no heads. It yields no grain. Should it yield, strangers would swallow it up. 
Israel is swallowed up. They are now among the nations, like a vessel in which no one delights. I love the language that was around before writing became so prevalent. Because in an oral society, words take on a beauty and they're put together in a way that's just really uh, pointed and beautiful and it's sculpted in a way that words today generally are not. Israel is swallowed up. For they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey all alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Back to the main metaphor of Hosea. Israel is in adultery with other nations. And in verse 10, even though they hire allies among the nations, now I will gather them up. And he's gathering them up to give them over, to use the language of Paul in Romans 1. And they will begin to diminish because of the burden of the king of princes. So the behavior that we see in northern Israel in the political events of the day, the currency uh, that's, that's existent there, um, is that it's not equivalent payback that God is going to give to them, but it's going to be an order of magnitude above this. They're sowing the wind, but how far worse is the return to them of the whirlwind? And so often our sin and our pursuit of sin does have this kind of result. It begins with something small, and we certainly didn't want it to turn into anything big, but doesn't it sometimes? Well, what a tangled web we weave. What a calamity we bring upon ourselves when we dally in things that we ought not. Their investment in evil is returning a return that's many times greater. For all their labor, in this analogy that, that uh, Hosea uses of sowing and reaping, the grain doesn't even sprout for them. And if it did, no one would grind it into flour. If there were someone to do that, foreigners would immediately gobble it up. Because of what they have done with the na nations, whom they have turned to for power instead of a God who desires to bless them. In retrospect, things can seem much clearer to us than they do in the, the moment when we're given to straying away from God. And it's things like this that help us to see more clearly in retrospect the bias that blinds us in the present. One of the things that we must take from these writings and, and the passages that we're looking at today in Hosea is that if this is the case, when we look back, we need to, to take that opportunity to learn how to look at ourselves now. What's the bias that's blinding me now to my own life? In what way am I living for someone other than God, for myself? or turning to other places or other people for influence and for power and for help. God is where we should turn. And blessed are we if we can learn to see that in the present instead of just in the past or in the distant future, making it a part of our daily walk. Their attempts at securing their future by an appeal to those around them, is doomed. I see this as such a strong temptation for the church today. We look around at everyone else. We want to be a part of that. If we're a part of this greater Christendom in a bigger way, our future will be secured. The church will be around for a long time. We will be able to have less conflict with others who may be seeking God, at least in name. God is speaking to this in this passage. Their attempts at securing the future leads to their doom. 
when they seek the help and their alliance to the nations around them. Israel has already been consumed, and it's like an empty vessel that one just tosses into the trash or discards. It's clear that Israel has hired itself out to the nations. This likely means that they have, um, they have spent what they have t- to help um, get provision against the pressure and the danger of those very nations or perhaps other nations. It's these nations who are her lovers. Such behavior and unwarranted trust in those nations makes Israel like a wild donkey, standing all alone, having given up God, they haven't become a part of these other nations. And so they end up all alone. They end up being taken advantage of by these other nations. So Israel, having turned to political alliances instead of to God, ensures that they will receive a penalty of putting their trust there and rejecting an opportunity to trust in him. He'll not only give them over to their sin, but he'll even gather them together in such arrangements so that in the end they will decline. It will be a terminal result for them, terminal weakness and an added burden. Verses 11 through 14. Since Ephraim has multiplied altars for sin offering, they have become altars of sinning for him. Now think about what he's saying. Though I wrote for him 10,000 precepts of my law, they're regarded as a strange thing. In other words, they don't know them. They certainly are not living within them. As for my sacrificial gifts, they sacrifice the flesh and eat it, but the Lord has taken no delight in them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish them for their sins. They will return to Egypt or to captivity in the new Egypt, which is Assyria. For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. And Judah has multiplied fortified cities, but I will send a fire on its cities that it may consume its palatial dwellings. There's some difficult translation um, in Hosea and particularly in, in this passage, but in several that we've looked at throughout this class. Um, but the gist of the meaning is, is clear enough. Israel goes through the motions They make the sacrifices to God, but they're not honoring God. They're coming together for the feast, to eat of the grain and of the the flesh that is cooked there on the altar. The Lord sees this, that they're not honoring him, and so he will not accept them. Israel has forgotten the Lord and has built temples and fortresses or palaces instead. The Lord, on the other hand, has turned Israel into a sacrifice for sin. Now that's a deep thought. Israel herself is being turned into a sacrifice for sin because of the truth of her stance toward God. Regardless of what the outward appearances may be. Israel has multiplied sacrifices, but God has multiplied instructions to help them through this, to which Israel turns a blind eye and a deaf ear. Not only that, Israel has considered God's righteous instruction to them, the law, as a peculiar and a strange thing. God is not accepting of their sacrifices, however choice those may be. He's going to remember their sin 
and he's going to return them to captivity. This latter resonates with the Lord remembering his people in Egypt and crying out in bondage in the book of Exodus. And here, in the middle of the 8th century or so before Christ, God will remember their iniquity and return them to Egypt. And this, of course, means most likely the new Egypt, which is Assyria. Instead of remembering the law of God, they have turned to building elaborate showcases of temples, places of worship, of palaces, and fortress strongholds. These will all be consumed by fire. And of course, Jesus has something to say like this in the New Testament. When his disciples talk about how beautiful this temple is, and what is it he says to them? He tells them truly, there's not even going to be stone left upon stone at the end of this. The edifices and the things we build around us that point to honor for God cannot stand in as honor for God. He's going to send a fire and consume them. The sacrifices they eat at their temples refer back to the voluntary sacrifices of the first five chapters of Exodus that we see there, in which only the fatty portion is typically burned on the altar and the rest is consumed by the priests and those who offer the sacrifices themselves. This is going on. So one is reminded of the peace offerings, which appear to have been a sit-down meal at the tabernacle or at the temple, depending on when in history that was, as a celebration of restored relationships that have been broken, the, the making of peace. And so these represent a crushing of peace, a rejection of God, of anger and rebellion, and of fighting against God. It's anything but peace. It's a deceit which goes to the core of their being. So with that said, let's go back and look at some of these statements again. Because in the heart of these statements, we'll find application that's very prevalent in today's culture and very prevalent for us to consider. Hosea has some hard things to say. And so... We are in a hard position ourselves when we look to God's message and instead of just treating it as though this is ancient history, this couldn't apply to us, we need to look closely at what's said here and see if there is any bias in us to which these might apply. To see if there are things in our heart that resonate with these things that he has to say. Just as with Israel in the time of Hosea, God would heal us. They do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. You know, with the passing of time, we tend to forget things like that, especially if we're forgiving people. And we tend to, um, to think it's inappropriate to remember something from long ago. That's ancient history. Why are you bringing that up? Well, if it's sin that's never been dealt with, if I don't bring it up, God's going to be the one bringing it up. And do you really want that? God is telling them to remember all their wickedness and to know that God sees these things and he takes account for them. And even though he hasn't acted against them directly, it doesn't mean that there will be no consequence. Sin always has a consequence. None of them calls on me, he says. Now, this none of them calls on me, they're wailing in their beds, so they're crying. They're just not crying to God. A poignant thought for where we should turn in our distress. Where we go for power, 
Where do I go for strength, for a way out, for a way over the obstacles or the difficulties that I see in my life? God should be at the middle of that. It's a great reminder for us. God would heal us if we will just turn to him. Put our trust and our hope in him. Ephraim mixes himself with the nations and has become a cake not turned. Does this apply to the church today? To Christians? If so, how? Who are the nations today that we might mix ourselves with? Society and culture, certainly a big part of that. But what about the general culture of religion and of Christianity in the world? Some of which is fantastic, but other of which is not really godly or based in his word. God would say, come out from them. Do not be a part of this world around you. Don't mix yourself with the nations. When those things are not a part of my word, my 10,000 precepts that I have given to you, look to those first. I would redeem them. They do not cry to me from their heart. They cry out to me, my God, we of Israel know you. I think there's a lot of validity in looking closely at this question. How much we assume we know God and what his heart is and what his thoughts are. And yet, we can take God for granted, and we can take it for granted that we know him, and even more that we're aligned with him because of these things that we do that go through the motions, that touch at what are the heart of our practices. God, I pray before every meal, thanking you for that meal. Yeah? And what about the rest of your day? What about your goals? What about the way you live your life? outside of your fellowship with other Christians? Do we know God the way he would have us know him? This is his, one of his biggest um, problems with the Israel of Hosea's day. It was also the biggest problem that he had with Israel coming out of the Exodus were in the Exodus coming out of Egypt. Hebrews tells us, they didn't even know my ways. They didn't honor him. They rejected him. They thought they knew him. But in not honoring him, there's no way they could know him. I would suggest that this is a good thing for us to pray about this week. God, do I know you the way you would like me to know you? And if not, help me to know you more completely. Help me to desire that. Show me the ways in which I need to grow or to overcome these assumptions, these biases, these things that I put in place that placate me when I may not consider that you remember my straying from you, the things I do that are for me, not for you, and I'm hiding those in the corner of the heart over here, perhaps, or maybe I just, in my assumptions, go throughout without even questioning why I'm doing them. This is a great thing for us to pray about this week. You may want to do that. This next one is such a beautiful question. It's a lament of God. How long will they be incapable of innocence? How can God's people be incapable of innocence?
Are there ways in which we have given up innocence and replaced it with something different and are not interested in innocence? We can become capable of innocence again is underneath at the heart of this question. How can God turn our lack of innocence into something that is innocent again? It's a great thing to, to focus on if you're looking for something in your quiet time to think about this week. Talk with other people about this. How can you become more capable and practice the seeking of innocence, of being innocent in all things? They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. You know, sowing the wind is not always an intentional deviation from our service to God. In some ways, it's kind of like frivolity. It's just, just light and airy. I'm just going about not giving much thought or soberness or focus to these things. Sowing the wind can come out of good intentions, can it? Raise your hand if you think it can. It can. I can have good intentions and create a maelstrom of results that lead to terrible things, catastrophic things sometimes, certainly to consequences and chaos that I did not intend. We should be sober. We should be careful what we are sowing, intentional about these things. Israel is swallowed up. They are now among the nations like a vessel in which no one delights. All of her goodness has been stolen by those in whom she has put her trust for protection. The hiring of the nations in pursuing them in her passion to be like the world, to be a part of the world, to be protected by the world. Israel has become an empty vessel, something to throw onto the discard pile. They have become altars of sinning for him. That is, their altars of which they have built many for sacrifice. Because the sacrifice has been co-opted by them for feasting and for parties. Yeah, they're going through the motions for sacrificing to God, but this is, this is something we're pursuing for us. The new wine and the grain and the meat which we can share together. Is it possible that something that we build in the service of God can be used as a means of rejecting God or of working against God? This is a question that Jesus visits in the Gospels. God laments in this next to the last one here, though I wrote for him 10,000 precepts of my law, they are regarded as a strange thing. Would God love to see us more engaged in Bible study? Do you think that would bring about increased blessings in our lives? If we dwell on these things, if we put them in our hearts and we pray about them and we ask God to help us find a way to live these things out that he would teach us, would that be a good thing? Is there anything bad that would come from that? Yeah, you would lose some time that you would be giving to other things. And there's no question about the fact that sometimes reading God's Word takes time. It's work. I know that studying the Scriptures is work, and sometimes that work is hard. 
But the things that come out of that are so beautiful. The Lord has taken no delight in their sacrifices. This is a fear that we in our lives and in the things that we sacrifice in the name of God become something for which he has no regard because it's something that is not for him. And so therefore God removes himself from that process. This is one of the biggest risks throughout any age of brotherhood, of worship together, that we convince ourselves to do things that appear to honor God, but we put our own ideas in them. We insert our own biases. Sometimes we'll even change or disregard pieces of Scripture that really work against our goal and our bias and the things that culture would have us believe and practice. It's my prayer that these difficult things that Hosea is raising up before us would be something that we put into our hearts, that we think about these difficult things things that he's raising up because they will help perfect us they will sharpen us and they will help us to be 10,000 times more fruitful in our service to God God longs to have a deep relationship with each one of us is that also our longing I want to thank you for your attention this morning. You've paid attention to me as though I were actually Mark himself. So let's pray uh, as we end our class. And I hope that there's been something in today's message that will touch you and that will be useful to you in your walk in Christ this week. Pray with me if you would. Our Holy Father, how grateful we are again that you so plainly point out the truth and you let us know that you are a God and have always been a God of compassion, of desiring fellowship and goodness for us, your children. Father, help us to value that and help us to honor you above all the things in the world around us that we are tempted to honor instead or to focus on or to give our hearts and lives to. We pray your blessings on us, not only in this study, but in the week to come, that it will be an effective message to us and something that we can use to become more clearly defined from the nations around us, which seek to have us mixed in with them. Father, we appreciate you, and we appreciate your discipline even because of what it produces in us, a faith that's of sterling quality, that's pure and that's deep and that's strong, regardless of the circumstances and the world around us. And Father, help us to turn to you in our need for strength and power and meaning. Bless us today in our worship and in our fellowship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.